Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, yeah. You can have a post rapture celebration after this. <laughs> so, and, and, and as I say, this really has to do with the science of experience. Recent and scientific understanding of experience. Uh, we are living in a post-Cartesian age. Uh, mind and body are, are just what are considered as one. The dualistic view of, of nature is pretty much passed by anybody with any, any kind of rationality. Our consciousness is embodied, and I think this is an important uh, observation, that our brains did not evolve to enable us to think, but to better make our way in the world. Okay? Laws of thought can be seen as metaphorical extensions of uh, physical processes by which we make our way in the world. And Lakoff and Johnson are is a really good source, are really good sources for uh, a, a pretty, pretty straightforward description of all this. And that reason is not disembodied, as tradition is largely held, but it arises from the nature of our brains and bodies and our experience. <coughs> and the same mechanisms, same normal and cognitive mechanisms that allow us to perceive and move around are the ones that are also create our conceptual systems and our modes of reason to use the same brain areas to use. Reason is shaped crucially by peculiarities of our human bodies, by the remarkable details of the neural structure of our brains, and by the specifics of our everyday functioning in the world. I thought this was the best description of that, of embodied cognition that I've seen. And the best uh, book for this uh, is still, it's 10 years old now, but I think it's still the best uh, basic uh, treatment of this is uh, Philosophy in the Flesh by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson. Uh, we look at the characteristics of reason as an embodied phenomenon. It's evolutionary. It builds on the, uh, and makes use of things that were already there, and particularly in the so-called lower animals. I hate that phrase. It's just other animals. And uh, places us on a continuum with them. We build, like uh, evolutionarily, in general, we build on what came before. It's not a discontinuance. It's universal, the capacity is shared by everyone. It's mostly unconscious, and there's been an awful lot of work lately that has shown that even the decisions we make are made by the, the brain-body organism. And then there's even a, a, a pretty strong hypothesis that we, uh, we, our body and minds make a decision, and then another part of our brain makes up a reason for why we just made the decision. <laughs> and, and we say that's why we did it. <laughs> we continually uh, have to create justification for the things we've decided to do without free will, you know, in the classical sense. And it's not purely literal, literal but largely metaphorical and imaginative. Uh, language is really a, 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 a tough subject to, to, uh, to, to get a handle on. Every word is some way or another built into other metaphors and other, other uh, analogies. And we, we swim around in these metaphors and analogies without a real solid basis for, for a lot of our, uh, uh, our definitions. And, it, and we have to deal with that. And it's not dispassionate. It's emotionally engaged. This is probably one of the most important discoveries in the, in the past several years. So let's look at emotion and reason, because I think that's the connection that we'll get back to why we're, we, we uh, have leaned towards reason and uh, emotion. Neuroscience and cognitive science have shown that all human thinking is motivated by feeling and vice versa. There's an awful lot of work on this. Uh, brain imaging, uh, for example, uh, positron emission tomography, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, have shown a close interaction of the emotional and cognitive systems in the brain. Two books on this, and he's got two or three others after this, but they, uh, again, the basic uh, uh, Treatises, treatises on these are uh, two by Antonio Damasio, Descartes, are in feeling what happened with these two others that continue on this, uh, this line. And from studies of people with brain lesions, uh, coupled with imaging and uh, uh, coupled with, with brain imagery, neuroscientists like uh, Damasio have concluded that emotions and feelings are not epiphenomenal to thought but an important component in the process of how we make our way in the world. What we know, in essence, is saturated with what we feel. I, I, I had read Andy Thompson's book, uh, While We Believe in Gods, uh, when it first came out, and then I had to 
privilege of looking through his, uh, of watching his presentation there on the video that you have on your website. And it was absolutely fascinating. It, it, just as he talks about, uh, you know, the religions piggybacking on human adaptations, I'm going to piggyback in this presentation <laughs> and, uh, and adapt this a little bit. Belief in the embodied mind, just a kind of a quick summary in how it fits here. The religion derives from the same mind brain social adaptations, now we move into the social areas, that we use to navigate the sea of people <coughs> around us. That's one of the most, in other words, how we make our way in the world, in the social world. <coughs> Religious beliefs are built upon, they piggyback onto these adaptations, and God is a byproduct of the mind's cognitive uh, mechanisms, essentially. And he, he went on to, uh, to list a whole bunch of adaptations that uh, go into uh, religion. I, I'm not going to describe all of these, but I, he, he just he, uh, explains them extremely straightforwardly in his, in his book. I appreciate that these techniques, probably remember these intuitive reasoning, Minimal counterintuitive world, one of my favorites. <laughs> Dualism, theory of mind, intentionality, promiscuous teleology, attachment, mirror neurons, which I'll talk a little more about, transference, childhood credulity, uh, deference to authority, kin psychology, and I'm going to just go through a couple of these to kind of illustrate uh, along with physical altruism, moral family systems and ritual behavior of our, the others. But let me cover just three of these to kind of illustrate uh, the principle. Uh, so just give us examples of these adaptations. One thing to keep in mind that these 18 or whatever, whatever the number is of uh, adaptations, we all have those. And if, if religion doesn't uh, latch onto those and piggyback on them, we have to deal with what we do with these ones. So it's really important that we look at them in terms of how as a humanist, rational, compassionate person would actually utilize these adaptations and see if we're not being sucked into this. Okay. Minimum counterintuitive worlds. This is a slight twist in some property of a basic entity that otherwise remains the same and familiar. That religions make us kind of just take another step forward from something that's very familiar to us, but that is not something we experience. <laughs> and I, it's, it's a lot like fairy tales are to children. And an example of that, uh, okay, is the Judeo-Christian God is everywhere. Otherwise, he's just a guy. <laughs> <laughs> so you you know you got all these you have all these human characteristics. Oh, by the way, he always everywhere. He sees everything. So there's just one more step further, okay. and that and the human mind is kind of uh, ready to accept things like that. If you look at dualism, which he does a very good job on, the whole idea that the opinion that mind and body are separate, and it's this, this problem is exacerbated because the mind and body are represented by different uh, neural circuits in the brain, so that when we, uh, oops, are they there? <laughs> okay. So religious ideas fit neatly into the structure, so things like the soul can be uh, attributed to this, uh, this the, 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 the spirit kind of thing, the afterlife, all of that kind of builds on uh, the, the wrong opinion that the mind and the body are separate. Okay. And mirror neurons are a really special case. And this is a picture from the Wall Street Journal on uh, March 4th, to 2005. And uh, these derive from the fact that the motor systems in our brain are very closely linked to uh, the visual, auditory, and tactile areas, so the sensory system. Sensory system. Uh, certain neurons become active to goal-directed uh, acts. So somebody reaches up or something will reach out, so those particular neurons anticipate something, grabbing something, for example. All right. And they respond, this is, the, this is the, the important discovery, they respond when we interact with, some, with others or just when we're observing these interactions. The emotions like actions are immediately shared. So the emotions as well, uh, we, we, uh, we, we share, we see perceptions of pain, grief, disgust, joy, activate the same brain areas as if we experienced them ourselves. So if you remember Clinton, uh, we probably really did uh, feel our pain. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, 
the case, I think the case for humanistic humility uh, for all of us. Um, there's a story, and I'm sure you heard, I think it's Stephen Hawking that uh, uh, originally told it, but I've heard from others. There is a cosmologist is giving a lecture on the uh, on the galaxy and the solar system, and he says he was describing how the Earth rotates around the Sun and the Moon around the Earth, and the and the Sun itself rotates around the center of the galaxy with all the other uh, other stars. And when he had finished his presentation, there came a voice from the back of the room and said, "All that you've just said is rubbish. The world is a flat plate." resting on the back of a very large elephant. And the, uh, the, uh, the scientist who's giving the lecture says, uh, just to try to uh, dissuade this person, that what does the elephant stand on? Why, on a large turtle, of course, an even larger turtle. And he said, well, okay, then what does the turtle stand on? Another turtle, of course. And this goes on and on with each iteration adding another turtle. And finally, when the scientist is really exasperated, the voice in the back says, it's no use, young man. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, it's not really turtles all the way down. It's, it's, a, it's a mystery. <laughs> it's emergence all the way up. And there's a, the uh, Royal View, who is a kind of a naturalist and a philosopher, came up with a really good, almost poetic description of this that I'd like to share. He said, in the course of uh, epic events, matter was, <laughs> and you need the big bang here. <laughs> there it goes. Distilled out of radiant energy. I don't know what this is more for me. Well, it's a brand new fire. <laughs> Segregated into galaxies, collapsed into stars, fused into atoms, swirled into planets, spliced into molecules, captured into cells, mutated into species, and cajoled into cultures. <laughs> All of this and much more is what matter has done as systems upon systems of organization have emerged over 13 billion years of creative natural history. There's a, that was Royal View, let's see, it should be you in that room. Now, I had a couple of other quotes that I think are very effective. Uh, you take a great cloud of hydrogen gas and leave it alone, 14 billion years later, it becomes rose bushes, giraffes, and human beings. <laughs> But four billion years ago, the earth was molten rock. Now it sings opera. Here's a statement from Brian Smith. Famous statements like this. And there's a book called, uh, 28 Steps, sounds like a film noir, but it's really about the 28 Steps. And uh, you can, these are somewhat arbitrary, but it kind of illustrates the sort of transition that's gone on in, uh, in emergent evolution. The star with the primordium, it moves a large scale structure, stars, the elements, solar systems, planets, the geosphere, the biosphere, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, cells with organelles, multicellularity, neurons, two sub kingdoms of animals, chordates to vertebrates, fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, arboreal mammals, primates, the great apes, hominids, the tool makers, language, agriculture, technology and urbanization, philosophy, and this last one, the spiritual, which I'm not talking about. <laughs> that last one. But that's where you ending up with the with the uh, the more wondering where we are. And I don't know if there's another much better words for that. But anyway. So what's the case for human humility with this kind of understanding of where we come from and where we are? Each new form has emerged from the self-organization of precursor forms. You have, we have essentially uh, <coughs> atoms make molecules, molecules make cells, and go all the way up. And the level of organization that we, which we 
find ourselves is probably not the final one. Okay? Processes of self-organization and emergence are relentlessly forward biased and creatively combinatorial. Strong, there are strong reasons to believe that these two processes are proceeding along the next tier left up on the complexity ladder in the universe, on the Earth particularly. We can't control it, and we don't really have any way to fully conceptualize it. We may be able to get deeper and deeper understandings, but fully understanding what's going on is, is not complex. One of these complex systems so we call the Earth is hard to Geopolitical turmoil, genetic engineering, emerging of human and artificial intelligence, the World Wide Web, instantaneous communication, climate change, globalization. And these are just a few of the evolving systems that are happening right before our eyes. And all of this should fill us with a profound sense of existential humility for where we are and what we can do about these things. So what does all this mean for us, for humanist naturalists and free thinkers of, of all stripes? We need to foster closer interactions among ourselves and between others and ourselves in the world, these human interactions which have components of, uh, of social divergence. And we must work together to enhance the influence that our shared principles, values, and activities have in the workings of our associations, our society, and the world. So, humans of the world unite. Let's get into a little bit of that, what that might mean. Uh, this, I think, is a really good illustration of what, uh, what the growing edge of, uh, of um, people that will be attracted to humanism and to atheism and to, uh, to uh, free thinking. This is a fascinating change. For, this is a, a survey of American youth and young adults. Uh, and what's <coughs> shown here are the number of the change in the number of percentage of people that show by the evangelical Protestant, the red line, are no religious preference, and they're called the nuns. <laughs> since, uh, since about 1990, you can see this amazing transformation happening. That the uh, people from 19 to 29, are the, the numbers or percentages are falling off rapidly for, for uh, fundamentalists and growing rapidly for those with no religious affiliation. This is a, a extremely uh, wonderful thing to be happening and something that we've got to really Rattle onto and provide the answers to these the people that are have no longer have a religious preference, but really want to uh, to understand where they are in the world and have a, 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 a good view of what they should be doing. So I think that we have to be looking for the synergies between secular uh, humanism and new humanism, even though they're both secular <laughs> in, in in essence. One come and I'll show you how I think they, they fit together. If we just look in terms of these nuns, you know, they don't have affiliation. The secular nuns, those who never had any kind of uh, affiliation with religion, and there are lots of those in the millennial generation that just never had, never had to even deal with religion and don't think anything of it at all. Some of you may be a part of that. I think the natural thing for them to be attracted to a purely secular uh, humanist organizations. I think those religious nuns that have uh, um, felt that they've been, uh, they've lost their religion, you know, that they no longer believe the stuff that they grew up with or that they believed, and, and many of them uh, take a real um, uh, complete <coughs> rejection of religion. I, I was one of them. I, years ago when I was a uh, youth, I was going to be planning to become an Episcopal priest. And I was an acolyte, and I was sitting up in the, uh, I was carrying, carrying the cross in the procession, I was sitting up in the, in the, act of the uh, crucifer, they call it, the crucifer seat. And uh, uh, people coming up for communion, and this overwhelming, so I didn't question anything for a long time, this overwhelming sense came over me, this is all crap. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it just took the bottom out of my life, I'm going to be a priest, and now I didn't believe anything. <laughs> Uh, and so I ended up with this kind of a back because I went into like all the youth back then that I was in my existential period of my life. I carried my pocket Nietzsche around with all those kind of things. Um, but what, what uh, and I, I, I sort of backed into science. I was really good at science and math. And I did it, I became a scientist by default. 
It was only later in life that I realized the same motivations that wanted me to do, that I wanted to become a priest to understand how I how I relate to reality. I found for science, and not for some religious kind of, kind of thing. And I ended up very uh, ended up the, the community that that really appealed to me then, and I think still appeals to some of these religious moments who go through that same kind of process as Unitarian Universalism, where it welcomes uh, that sort of thing. Now. This is where I think it's really important that we have an independent status from Unitarian Universalism. If we were affiliated, we would be in that Unitarian Universalist box. Okay? But we're not. We have an independent status. And this gives us a, a, a significant opportunity to become a bridge from the secular uh, to the religious event. I think that what we're, what we're doing is we've got to really work as a, as a, uh, as a uh, conduit from, from, from secular ideas into Unitarian Universalism at the same time give an opportunity for those religious ones to come all the way over to the secular, that's what they want, but to, to, to be bringing them into that. We have to work together to do that. I think the two, the, the humanist organizations, secular and humanist in the middle, are kind of a humanist engine for, for growth in humanism in general. And let me talk about some of the couple of things that we're, uh, we're doing to kind of build this, uh, to, to make the bring this engine up to speed, some of the initiatives that we've started with UU Humanists. One between, with the UU Humanists, the interaction between UUs and secular humanist organizations. We're cooperating with the AHA to establish and support local humanist groups. Okay, it's not gonna matter to us whether it's AHA or, or, or the UU Humanists or some kind of combination of both, but we wanna see uh, and local groups formed and expanded and, and uh, encouraged. And we'll do all we can to try to provide venues for that and to make that, make that work. And an example of the uh, working at the interface between uh, the UU Humanists and Unitarian Universalism, uh, we've established a new publishing arm called Religious Humanism Press because our journal is Religious Humanism. Uh, the first publication is a new book uh, by Bill Murray. And, uh, yeah, that's it there. This is the last copy, but you can order copies online. Yep. Yeah. And in fact, I, I'll show you right now how you do that. It's becoming more fully human, and this is really, remember, to appeal to the Unitarian Universal end of things. So there's a that interface. Uh, and it approaches uh, humanism primarily as a way of life rather than a philosophical perspective, but also includes some discussion of the philosophical foundations. We're really trying to present humanism as a basis for living in a meaning, meaningful and fulfilling way. And which enables us to become a fully human. It's uh, 16 bucks, uh, and you can get it at www.humanist2use.org. Another area we're working on, particularly with with uh, secular humanist organizations, uh, okay. Uh, we've applied to become full members of the secular.